Peter chapter 1 for our Christmas Bible study. And tomorrow we will be preaching a Christmas message all to the glory of God. First Peter chapter 1 tonight. And we're going to look to verse number 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. We're going to use verse 10 as a kind of a starting point, though we're going to be in a lot of places tonight. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, We'll go ahead and use verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify. Our title for tonight's study, The Mystery of the Messiah. The Mystery of the Messiah. Let's start with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. We ask you to bless it now in the ministering and hearing and learning thereof. In Jesus' name, amen. So this teaching tonight will be a part one. And the part two will be preached in tomorrow morning service. The mystery of the Messiah. The promise of the Messiah was one that was, that was and still is highly misunderstood by a lot of people. It was highly misunderstood by those in the Old Testament for good reason. Because they did not have the completed word of God like we have it today. But the promise of the Messiah is still highly misunderstood by people today, especially the nation of Israel as a whole. They have, and everyone else has, far less excuse to not understand the promise of the Messiah. Because we have the Word of God, we have the Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher. And so we have many resources. But being that the devil is the God of this world, he blinds the minds of people, and therefore they do not seek the truth, but rather they seek that which pleases themselves. So for those who did not have the word of God like we have it today under the Old Testament, they did not understand the, fully understand the promise of the Messiah. Peter, that's what he's writing about here in chapter 1. He's saying that there were prophets in the Old Testament who wrote prophecies about the Messiah, and yet they didn't even understand the full picture of what they were writing. But we have it because we have the, the completion of the Word of God. In Satan's attempt to replace the actual reason for celebrating Christmas, we now have Santa Claus, reindeer, and elves. That's Satan's, up, uh, that's Satan's attempt to replace the real reason for Christmas. And this is something that many people seem to be happy to focus on rather than the real reason. Because what does Santa Claus promise you? Whatever you want, as long as you're good, right? As long as you're good, you get on Santa's good list. Question, who defines good, right? <laughs> Have you been good? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so who wouldn't rather follow a Santa Claus? He gives you what you want. But thank God for Jesus who gives us what we need. Amen. Giving us what we want is very appealing to those who focus on carnal things. But giving us what we need will get you into eternity with God. In this message, we're going to teach about the mysteries that surround the Messiah and how they are fulfilled and could only have been fulfilled by Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ and Messiah. So first, let's talk about this, the mystery of the Messiah. Remember now, 
And before we get too far into this, I want you to keep this in mind. As we're teaching through this, the mystery of the Messiah is far less of a mystery to us because we have the completed Word of God to tell us why Jesus was the Messiah and still is. So when we're going through this teaching, keep your mind in the frame of an Old Testament Jew. An Old Testament Jew. Specifically, the prophets who wrote and spoke of the coming Messiah who had not yet come. Keep your mind in the frame of an Old Testament prophet who was prophesying things that they knew was from God, that they knew were from God, but they did not know how they fit into the big picture. So when we say the mystery, we simply mean something that has not yet been revealed. That's it. Because we have the completed 39 books of the Old Testament and completed 27 books of the New Testament, collated into one comprehensive book called the Holy Bible, we now have access to many answers than those who were before us. So let us never take for granted the word of God that we have, because the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, they were in the process of writing what we now have. And so we thank God for the Bible that we have, and we ought, to be, we ought to be remembering to remain thankful because we have the whole picture. To those living in Old Testament times, and especially those prophets whom God chose to write Messianic prophecies, the prophecies they received and wrote were a mystery to them because they did not yet understand, as we do today, how those prophecies could have come to pass at all much less come to pass by one person. So what did Paul, uh, rather Peter write to us? He said, they were writing prophecies that they didn't fully understand, but one thing that the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did tell them was this. These prophecies are not for you to understand. They are for people in the future to understand. That's what we read about. That's what we just read in 1 Peter chapter 1. That the Spirit revealed to them Okay, you're not going to understand this, but people in the future will keep writing. Peter explains to us this very truth that we've been talking about recently. And so thank God we don't have as limited knowledge as they did. During the Old Testament, though many prophecies went forth about the Messiah, those prophecies seemed to contradict one another, which is why I'm bringing out the mystery of the Messiah. Because they weren't just giving prophecies, they were giving prophecies that seemed to contradict one another. And when things seem to contradict themselves, this is what's called a paradox. A paradox is nothing more than a combination of statements that seem to contradict each other, but they actually are both true. They're both true. So we're talking, let's talk about the paradoxes of the messianic prophecies. How that these prophecies that went forth, sometimes even from the same prophet, contradicted other prophecies, seemed to contradict other prophecies, and yet ended up being that they're both true. They didn't know that at the time. You have to realize, remember, we're thinking like an Old Testament prophet, right? They didn't know that both prophecies that seemed to contradict each other, they didn't know that they were both true. So let's talk about a few of them. The Messiah would have the government upon his shoulder, Isaiah says, signifying world dominance. The government upon his shoulder, Isaiah 9 and 6 tells us, showing that the government of the whole world would rest upon the Messiah. But then later in Isaiah 53, he says the Messiah is despised and rejected of men. So an Old Testament prophet may ask this question, how can you rule the world and be despised and rejected by the world at the same time? You see how there's a paradox there? We understand. We have the book of Revelation that tells us, but Isaiah didn't have the book of Revelation. So therefore, Isaiah gave both prophecies. He would have the government of the world upon his shoulder, but the world would reject him. How can that be? How can you rule a world if it rejects you? Good question. Number two. We're told also in Isaiah 9 and 6, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. But then in Isaiah 53, we're told that He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
So the prophet may have asked this question, how could, it be, how could he be called wonderful if he's filled with sorrows and grief? Doesn't make sense, does it? It makes sense to us, but it doesn't make sense, didn't make sense to Isaiah. Also this, he was called in Isaiah 9 and 6, the mighty God. But in Isaiah 53, he's called man of sorrows. How could he be the mighty God and yet be a man? Of sorrows. God and man at the same time, how could this be? See, Isaiah didn't, he didn't know what we know. He didn't have what we have. We know God, uh, Jesus came from God through the virgin birth of Mary. We know all that. I mean, kids know that stuff. They're going to be taught that stuff. But Isaiah didn't know. He didn't understand how a man could be God and man. The mighty God, yet a man of sorrows. And yet Isaiah is the one who received both of those prophecies from God. Next, how about this? The Messiah is called in Isaiah 11.10, the root of Jesse. Now Jesse was the father of King David. The root of Jesse, signifying that he, the Messiah, existed before Jesse, the father of David, just as the root of a tree exists before the rest of the tree exists. Yet the Messiah is called a branch that comes from Jesse. So how can you be the root and a branch? The root comes before the tree, and the tree comes before the branch. And yet this Messiah is going to be before and after Jesse? How is that even possible? Because Jesus existed in eternity past, way before Jesse. And he came through the virgin birth, through Mary, after Jesse. So you see how there's a paradox here? We know this. You see how much knowledge we take for granted? And yet this great prophet of God, no doubt uh, older in age at this point, he didn't understand. How can he be a root and a branch? The Messiah would be the son of man while also being the son of God. And yet he would have no beginning nor ending. So how can you have no beginning and yet be the son of anybody? And then the son of man and the son of God and yet have no, uh, no beginning? We know, but they didn't know. Still talking about the paradoxes of the mysteries of the Messiah here. The Messiah would be a king and a servant. Now, in the culture of the Hebrews, they understood kings, and kings were not servants. Kings were not servants who lowered themselves to serve anybody. And yet the Messiah would be a king and a servant. We understand why, but they did not. And I'll, go to, I'll stop right here. The Messiah would be dead and yet live forever. We understand how that is, but he didn't understand. How could he die? How could it be? How could by his stripes we're healed? How could he be beaten and die, and yet he liveth forever? All of these were paradoxes with which those in the Old Testament had to wrestle and yet never fully understand. Paul writes in Hebrews eleven thirty nine, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And of course, Peter said in First Peter one of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. The mystery of the Messiah. Never take for granted the knowledge we have today of Jesus because great prophets, great men of God, even Jesus would say, desire to look into the things that you, desire to hear the things that you hear. So now that we somewhat understand the limited knowledge that they had under the Old Testament, let's look further at some of the mysteries of the Messiah. Next, let's talk about the Messiah's lineage. We're building the foundation tonight. Building the foundation. And through this teaching, you're going you're gonna to see the wisdom of God and, and how God does things. So the mystery of the Messiah's lineage. Listed in the lineage of the Messiah are some unlikely candidates. There are five women listed in the lineage of Christ. The Messiah. 
In the Hebrew culture, women were not normally listed in the lineage, but they are listed in the lineage of Jesus. You can read the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. Matthew chapter 1 gives the lineage of Jesus through his adopted lineage, through his stepfather Joseph, and Luke chapter 3 gives his lineage through his mother Mary. And so there are five women listed in the lineage of Christ, the Messiah, though women normally were not listed in lineages. We're only going to talk about one tonight. I'm going to list them out for you, but we're really going to focus in on one, and I'll tell you about that why in a moment. The five women are Tamar, Matthew 1 and 3, Rahab, who was a, who was a prostitute by profession, but she, she got married and had a child, and through her came Jesus Christ. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Ruth, who was an idolater, also Matthew 1 and 5. Bathsheba, who was an adulteress, Matthew chapter 1 and 6. And then, of course, his mother Mary, Matthew 1 and 16. But we're going to focus in tonight upon Tamar, T-A-M-A-R. We're going to focus on her because... We want to show you the links to which God will go in order to work all things together for good and to work out his perfect plan. The mystery of the Messiah's lineage. In Genesis chapter 38, if you'd like to go there, we're going to spend some time there tonight. In Genesis chapter 38, we read that Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Now, we take it for granted that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of what? Judah. Really, of whom? Judah. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob and Leah. We know from Genesis 49 and 10 that the Messiah was to come through the lineage of Judah. Genesis 49 and 10, Jacob telling his sons when he get the, the, about their futures, and when he gets to Judah, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people, or shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh is another name, Old Testament name, for the Messiah. And so right there, Jacob is prophesying that through your lineage, Judah, the Messiah will come. The problem is that there are some major problems in the life of Judah. Some major problems. Let's go back to, to Tamar. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. She was married to Judah's oldest son named Ur, E-R. Ur was so wicked that God killed him. We don't know how. The Bible just said God killed him. We don't know, or uh, rather we don't know how it's done. Judah then told his second son, Onan, O-N-A-N, Marry your dead brother's sister, Tamar, have a child with her, and name it after your brother. Because that was, what, that was a law at the time in their culture. If a man died without a child, he was married to die without a child, his brother married the widow, and their first son would be named after the dead brother. Onan didn't want to do that, because he was also wicked. He seems to have hated his brother, Either way, what we read in the Bible is he had sex with her, but he did not have a child with her. And God killed him too, because he was wicked. Judah promised his daughter-in-law that if she would remain a widow and live at her father's house, then as soon as Judah's youngest son, Shelah, grew up, he would marry her. After Judah's wife died, Judah went up to Timnath, and he saw there a prostitute. He goes in and he has sex with the prostitute and he promises to pay her later with a young goat. That was something that was, obviously food was very important to them. They didn't have a Costco or a Sam's or a Walmart or a commissary. And so he said, I'll pay you later with a young goat. As collateral, she keeps his bracelets, staff, and his signet ring until he returns. Makes sense, right? He quickly returns with the goat, Judah does, knowing that the items she has could easily identify him, but he could not find the prostitute anywhere. So he went home. He was looking around, he was asking around, the prostitute was gone with his stuff. 
After three months, Judah hears. Now remember, Judah's wife had just died. After three months, Judah hears that Tamar, his daughter-in-law, is pregnant without being married. In that culture, they killed you for that. He then orders his daughter-in-law, because remember, she's supposed to be waiting until the youngest son grows up. He orders her to be burned. Now, in the Old Testament, there are only two offenses for which people may be burned. Because culturally, the Jews stoned you to death. But he said, let her be burned. There were only two reasons to be burned. Number one, the prostitution of a priest's daughter, Leviticus 21 and 9. If the daughter of a priest was being a prostitute, she was to be burned with the man that she was with. The second reason, incest. Leviticus 20.14, incest. The two people caught in incestual relationships were both to be burned. Not just stone, burned. As they were getting ready to burn Tamar for getting pregnant without being married, we read this in Genesis 38, still in Genesis 38, verse 25. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law. Now remember, they're bringing her out, ready to burn her. So as she's brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law saying, By the man whose these are, am I with child? And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelets and staff. The prostitute he had slept with was his own daughter-in-law, and he didn't even know it. You think the Bible's not full of twists and turns and, and plot twists? It absolutely is. I've got this signet ring. It says Judah number one on it. It doesn't say that, but I'm, just, I'm throwing that out there. You know whose it is, right? All right. Bracelets and staff. Tamar had dressed up as the prostitute. Judah didn't even know it. But he acknowledges his sin in verse 26. Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah my son, and he knew her or had sex with her again no more. Genesis 38, 26. But remember now, Tamar was pregnant. And the Bible shows us that she had twins by her, by her father-in-law, Phares and Zamar. And it would be through the lineage of Phares that the Messiah would come. Still talking about the mystery of the Messianic lineage. So let's talk now about the curse of being born out of wedlock. There was a curse from God by being born out of wedlock. In Genesis 49, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come to the lineage of Judah. We, we covered that earlier. But there was a problem. Judah's two older sons were dead, and he had twins by his daughter-in-law, but they were illegitimate children because they were born out of wedlock. And God pronounces a curse upon children born out of wedlock. Deuteronomy 23 and 2. It says, a bastard, or illegitimate child, a bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, and make sure you remember this next statement, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now that phrase, sometimes you see that phrase, even unto the tenth generation, or even unto whatever. Now there's two schools of thought on this, that, that number one, it's just a general statement that insinuates a long time. Or number two, it means literally ten generations. Most people like to give God the benefit of the doubt and help God out because God can't always make things happen on time. And they just say, well, it's just a general statement. And in the Bible, there are times you read that it is just a general statement. It's proven in the Word. But let me show you something. So the thought would be what? Well, God could just use J Judah's uh, youngest son, right? Shalom. Wrong. God uses the lineage of Phares, one of the illegitimate children, to bring the Messiah into the world. And let's see how God does that. Because remember the curse, until the 10th generation, they shall not enter. So how could God bring the Messiah through a cursed lineage? Back to Matthew chapter 1. 
And look at verse number three with me. Matthew chapter one, verse three. We're going to skip right, right straight to Pharisees. Pharisees. We're going to try to keep account as we go here. Pharisees, remember, was the illegitimate son of his father Judah. Therefore, starting at Pharisees until the tenth generation, the tenth generation was the releasing point. Pharisees begat Esram, number one, Pharisees. Number two, Esram begat Aram. Number three is Aram begat Aminadab. Number four is Aminadab begat Naasan. Number five is Naasan begat Salmon. Number six, Salmon begat Boaz or Boaz of Rahab, which is Rahab the harlot. Number seven, Boaz or Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Number eight, Obed begat Jesse. Number nine, Jesse begat David. Number ten is David. King, uh, David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So at the generation of David, the curse of the illegitimate child is broken, and now God can continue to bring the Messiah through this lineage. The previous nine generations would not have been allowed to be used to be a king. But David was used to be a king. The other nine could not be a king. But David was the first of this lineage to be a king. David succeeded King Saul, who was actually the first king of Israel. But then his lineage was wiped out, except for Mephibosheth. And David's lineage was installed by God and continues on through Jesus Christ today. So that's the mystery of the lineage of the Messiah. There's one person else I want to bring out to you tonight, which still shows us how God had to, or how God works things together for his good and for his plan to come to pass. Because we talked about fairies, and from fairies on through the nine generations until the tenth, there was a curse. But later on, there was another curse upon this lineage of King David. Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. So you might think God is out of the woods, right? All right, he got to the 10th generation. He can start good with David, but he wasn't out of the woods. I think God likes to put himself in the woods just to show how well he can bring himself out of the woods and, and, and blow everybody's mind. All right? This is how God is. He likes to blow people's minds, all right? Matthew 1, verse 11, And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Jeconias went by four names, three in the Old Testament, one here in the New Testament. The one in the New Testament, Jeconias, the three in the Old Testament, Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, and Coniah. Those are all three, all four, the same person. They're all Jeconias. He was a very wicked king in Israel's history. And it was during his reign that Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. God pronounces a curse upon Jeconias. Now remember, Jeconias is in the lineage of King David. All right, God, you just got out of one curse. You're clear. Quit getting yourself in trouble. Nope, God pronounces a curse upon Jeconias. Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 25. You don't have to go there. Just listen. But you can listen later if you'd like to learn all this, take notes and learn the Bible. Jeremiah 22, verses 24, 25. He says there, As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the sickness upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. God is saying, even if you were a ring on my finger, I would throw you away. That's what he's saying to Jeconiah here, or Coniah as he's called here. Verse 25. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life. Now jump to Jeremiah 22, 30. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless. Now Jeconiah had children. But when God says, write ye this man childless, he's saying, 
as, as it pertains to the throne. There will be no more king. As a matter of fact, he says there, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. So God says nobody else will be a king through the lineage of Jeconias. How is it? Now remember, Jeconias is downstream from, from David. So we're already past David. We're, in, we're to Jeconias. How is it that God cursed the lineage of Jeconias, and yet we read that Messiah would come through the lineage of Jeconias? Remember Matthew 1.11, Josias begat Jeconias? That's the lineage of Jesus. I thought God said no king would descend from Jeconias, and isn't Jesus the king of kings? So how is it that the Messiah, the king of kings, descends through Jeconias when God said there will never be a king? Remember earlier, fairies, the, the curse was what? The 10th generation is where it starts over. God said about Jeconias, nobody will be a king. And yet we read that Jeconias is in the lineage of Jesus, the king of kings. How is this? The lineage of Jeconias came through the lineage of King Solomon. Now I need to explain something to you. Backing up to King David. King David had many sons, and many sons had King David. But King David, there are two sons of David that really matter the most in the lineage of the Messiah. Solomon and Nathan. Those are really the only two sons that matter as it pertains to the lineage of the Messiah. Solomon became the king after David, right? King Solomon, we know that. Nathan was just a regular son of David. He was still royalty, but he wasn't a king. And so it was fine. He was still in the royal line, but the royal lineage did not come through him. It came through Solomon. So the lineage of Jeconias, going down now to Jeconias, came through King Solomon, side of King David. And it was through this lineage, Jeconias, Solomon, through Solomon, that Joseph, the husband of Mary, would come. Remember I told you earlier, Matthew chapter 1 shows us the lineage of Joseph, the adopted lineage of Jesus, and Luke chapter 3 shows us the biological lineage of Jesus through his mother Mary. In Matthew chapter 1, the adopted lineage goes back through uh, Joseph, back through Jeconias, through Solomon to King David. Through his mother Mary, goes back through Nathan to King David. And so God cursed the lineage of Jeconias and said there would never be a king from his lineage. But Jesus was not born through Joseph. He was adopted by Joseph. Therefore, the DNA of Joseph, which means the DNA of Jeconias, was not in Jesus. Which means Jesus was exempt from the curse on the lineage of Jeconias because he was not in the biological line of Jeconias. Who was Jesus' biological father? God. Jesus is still, however, because remember, he's a son of David. The Messiah is the son of David. The Old Testament uh, prophets, they talked about that. The New Testament prophets, they understood. The Old Testament, or rather the New Testament apostles, they understood. Even the Pharisees knew the Messiah would be uh, the son of David. And so now we see how that Jesus was exempt from the curse upon Jeconias because his biological DNA lineage comes through his mother Mary, through Nathan, the son of David. That's in Luke chapter 3, verse 31, Nathan, which was the son of David. Therefore, Jesus still gets to descend from King David and bypass the curse and be a king. Amen. Amen. And so with that, our foundation is laid. We're going to stop because our time is out. But we're going to pick up this message tomorrow, part two, Sunday morning, about the mystery of the Messiah. Let's close in prayer. Our Lord, we thank you, God, for the truth of your word. And Lord, we thank you for the excitement of the journey that your word takes us on. For in the minds of men and women, there will be many times we would say, how could, it, how could this happen? How's it going to work out? What does this mean? 
How is God going to make this one work? And yet so many times you show us that you are wiser than all of us and your ways are higher than our ways and that your thinking is above ours. So we ask you now, God, to bring our thinking up to a higher level. Open our minds, open our hearts, that we may think more like you do. And thank you, God, that the mysteries of the Messiah are all solved in one man. Jesus Christ. Though the mysteries were many and seemingly scattered abroad, they're all focused and accomplished in him. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to sharing God's word with you tomorrow. Amen.